Hi everyone, welcome to the first session of the day. It's uh, Monday, the third day of the RTR. We're really, really glad you're all here. I see people still uh, wandering in from the parking lot, so we might just wait just a second. Although this PA in here, and the sound in this uh, is very good. I don't, you hear really well, even in the back, don't you? Yeah, so it's just really good. Uh, just a natural, natural sound. Uh, so we're starting out today, uh, this morning, with Jim, James Bender, who uh, is going to teach on basic safety. The idea here is that I know there are many, many of you who are going out, really for the very first time, to spend any extended time in nature. And I know over the years, one of the questions I've gotten probably the most is asking about bears and snakes and coyotes, so, uh, and uh, tarantulas and bugs and on those things, so I'm sure you'll address those. Uh, but more than that, it's just the idea of getting comfortable in nature. That you can be safe and a few basic steps will just almost guarantee you'll have a safe time. And so just laying out a basic groundwork so you can come out and feel comfortable in nature on your own. And so um, I think that's going to be a really, really valuable experience for all of you. James Bender is the founder and lead instructor of Waypoint Survival School. He'll go through more of it in detail, and I'll just brief introduction. With 30 year experience, experience teaching self-reliance, uh, he has a YouTube channel, public, and he's a public speaker doing things like this. So, um, lots of experience, and I'm assuming military background? No, 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 no just grew up in the woods. Grew, grew up in the woods, that's why I'll, <laughs> once you develop that love for the woods and you start learning about it and spending time in it, you just learn and grow. So I think you're going to learn a lot, and it will. I think all of us will learn something, even if you're an old-time woodcrafter. I think you uh, you spend more time you spend with other woodcrafters, the more you learn. So James, thank you so much for coming. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. And enjoy. All right, good morning. It's good to see all of you here, and uh, thank you for coming. So, yeah, I started a long time ago when I was very young. Uh, we moved to very rural Tennessee when I was five years old in the late 1970s, and uh, I had always loved the outdoors. And we moved from around Tampa, Florida, and even at that point, uh, enjoyed the the sand and the cactus and. Not so much the fire ants, but you get the idea, right? But anyway, as just a little boy, uh, very interested in the outdoors, learning from my father and grandfather, and then on my own, spend a lot of time in the outdoors. And so as I grew older, of course, you, you develop more skills, more abilities, uh, started whittling and carving and, and uh, learning more about trees and berries and, and uh, building primitive shelters. Uh, and then, of course, uh, on into adulthood, and about 18 years ago, uh, I started to really get back into uh, more of a serious time frame uh, of, uh, and a mindset of just wanting to not only prepare myself and my family, but also to begin to train and teach other people. And so yes, I've been a public speaker for over 30 years and uh, just different things. I used to speak for the uh, Foreign Legion and uh, American Legion and do speeches and various things So as a teenager. But uh, at any rate, really enjoy uh, sharing what I have learned. And the one thing that I will tell you about survival is that it is a, a long-term and lifetime goal. You are forever a student. I don't know everything, and I, I don't think I ever will. And so I enjoy learning, and I enjoy meeting people. There are all kinds of new skills, new abilities, and I'm continually adding to my repertoire of what I what I teach and what I personally learn and so I'm gonna try to this morning to talk about getting out into wilderness so all right I went ahead and printed out my notes to so make sure that I stay on course and that I don't ramble so basic safety and survival skills you know getting outside is fun and it doesn't have to be scary uh, you know, the first time you camp out, you, you hear different sounds, there's noises, animals, uh, you know, even the, the owls and things at night. For people who are unfamiliar with the night sounds, it can be a little frightening. 
Now, I'm sure for a lot of you, uh, many of you uh, have spent a lot of time in the outdoors, uh, but maybe some of you haven't. And so I've, I tried to cover enough of the bases so that even if you are experienced, you're still going to find something that you can enjoy out of this. And again, so stories that we've heard, perhaps movies uh, that we've watched, Hollywood loves to scare us to death. Uh, and, and so, you know, the first thing you, you get out there and, and you're terrified. I know one lady, uh, she, after Jaws came out back in the 80s, she was scared to take a shower. A little rubber ducky floated up and hit her leg and she just screamed. Of course, the family thought that she was dying. But, uh, you know, you're in your own bathtub at home. But again, it's this, uh, this, this terrifying thing that, that makes a good film. But it also can sometimes lurk in the back of your mind and kind of terrorize you when you are in the outdoors. And so people are, are terrified to be away from the comforts of civilization and a sort of panic takes a hold of them if they feel that they won't have a cell phone signal or that you might miss a meal or two. And I don't know about you, but if I miss a meal or two, it's not going to kill me. Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, while you need to be cautious and careful, there is no need to be afraid to get into the back country. In the wilderness areas, we can find peace and beauty and solitude. There's fresh air and relief from the pace of the highways, the interstates, and the cities of our nation. It's one of the reasons we get out and do what we do, right? We all have a yearning to reach deep into the heart of the woods and deserts and bring out the satisfying nectar of tranquility and harmony and bring it into our lives. We're the ones who are not just satisfied to watch from the comforts of our living rooms and dens. No, we must experience the glory of the wilderness for ourselves. So for you and those like you, I have some ideas and some suggestions that you may find helpful, whether you are a beginner or an experienced backcountry wanderer. Now, before I get into these notes, if you're taking notes, you feel free to record this if you wish. But I also have some business cards here and uh, we'll be available for questions. I'll stay up here. Uh, I'll do my best to answer. I, I don't know everything, but uh, if you have any questions you want to ask me, I'll be glad to uh, do the best to give you an answer. Uh, the other thing is uh, my channel on YouTube is Waypoint Survival, and I hope you all go and subscribe and watch a whole bunch of stuff. I do a lot of very simple things. Uh, I, I try to teach repurposing. Uh, I like do-it-yourself type items. And I do a little bit of gear review, but uh, not a whole lot of that. And I've got a few videos of there where I've gone on adventures and, and uh, sometimes they work out well, sometimes they don't, but that's all part of training. We don't get to choose the kind of environment that we survive in. Uh, it just happens. And so being prepared is very important. So if this is your very first time in the deserts or forested areas, make your first time out simple. I would recommend that you go glamping, you know, glamour camping. Go, go easy, you know, pack all the stuff that you need and then some. Now, if you're backpacking, be very careful. One of the, one of the tricks to backpacking is choose a smaller pack because the bigger the pack, the more you'll stuff in it. And you'll begin to think, oh, maybe I'll need this and I might need that and, and pretty soon you end up with a 90 pound pack and, and you need a mule, you know, to carry it. So I can carry a 90 pound pack, but it's not fun. Uh, and, and so there's, there's always this, this kind of a rub between carrying enough and carrying too much. So I like to tell people this. Comfort at camp can mean a little misery on the trail because you're carrying more stuff. Comfort on the trail can mean a little misery in camp because you're not carrying very much stuff. So you want to hit that happy medium. You want to be at that place where you're carrying enough but not too much. So after your first time or two out, you come back, lay out your gear, anything you did not use, except for a first aid kit, which hopefully you didn't use, but you should always bring. <laughs> Leave it aside. You know, you don't need a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I always tell my students, the only piece of silverware that you need is a spoon. Normally you're carrying a knife uh, of some sort and you can always whittle a, a sharp pointy stick for a fork. You really don't need a full set of silverware. Things like that. Start thinking about how you can simplify your life and carry less stuff. And you don't have to go buy high dollar titanium or anodized aluminum, you know, fantastic, you know, aircraft grade stuff from a camping store. 
go to Goodwill and for 29 cents you can buy a tablespoon and it will serve you well. And if you drop it or lose it or tear it up, you can go buy another one for 29 cents. So don't take risks when you go out for the first time and, and please get some training. Come to my school or someone close. As Southern Ohio is a little distance from here but some of you from that area and I would love to train you but a little bit of training goes a long, long ways. So here's some rules to guide you when you go out. First of all, let someone know where you're going and how long you expect to be gone. Have adequate provisions for the time expected. And I would say if you're going out for a multi-day trip, make sure and have an extra day of supplies. And probably one of the best things you can do is a freeze-dried meal. They're super lightweight, so you're not carrying a lot of extra poundage and it only takes water. You don't even have to use hot water. You can just rehydrate it with cold water if that's what you have. But, uh, and, and I've, sometimes people ask me, you know, if you, if you could only take one thing, if, if you were in a survival situation, you could take one food, what would it be? It would be a jar of peanut butter. All right, a lot of calories, a lot of protein, and uh, sugars and all that. So really good for you. Also, when you're out, stay on established, well-maintained trails and don't get lost. Uh, don't travel at night in unfamiliar territory unless it's an absolute necessity. And then, you know, you've got to be really careful because you lose the ability to see objects and items and there's a lot of people have stumbled over small cliffs or even large cliffs because they really couldn't see the edge and you got to be really careful. Be aware of the critters that are in your area. Bears, wolves, coyotes, cougars, wildcats, scorpions, snakes, alligators, etc. Depending on where you are. Now, do keep in mind that as human beings, we are apex predators. All right, we are, we are pretty well toward the top of the food chain. But occasionally you'll get in swampy areas, you'll get in heavily forested areas and in places where there are grizzlies and brown bears and various other things. And, and you are not the top of the food chain. And you have to be really careful. You don't want to keep your food really close to you. You don't want to cook food close. You want to store it at least 100 feet to 100 yards out away from where you're actually camping and you want to prepare your food away from where you're sleeping at night because that food smell, uh, remember these critters can smell a lot better than we can. And so, I, and I know it's nice to lay there in your shelter and munch on beef jerky, but you may wake up and something's munching on you. So it's good, it's good to keep your food in a safe distance and uh, we'll cover that here in a little bit. But most wild animals are scared of you. And especially if you've got a fire, uh, because of forest fires and because of things, they have a natural inherent fear of fire. And so uh, a good fire at night is very important. All right, learn how to use a compass and the sun for basic directions and navigation. Always practice fire safety. Put your fire out when you're done. Make sure you clear an area uh, around where you're fire. Don't, don't be one of those careless individuals that destroys the natural environment. And, and be alert also when you are in areas that are prone to forest fires. Uh, you may not want to have a fire, but if it's an absolute emergency, then absolutely go ahead and just make sure that where you're starting your fire is in a safe place. And a lot of times you can find sandy areas or uh, around rocky areas on a creek bank or something. Just make sure that it's not raining and you get flooded out. You gotta be very careful in this particular country with flash floods. And always be aware of the four W's. And the four W's are this. Water, wind, wood, and widow makers. All right, now water, of course, you want to be close enough to water, but you want to be careful, as I said, that you don't get washed out or, or destroyed, uh, just destroy your camp even. Uh, even if you make it to escape, escape to safety, you may find that your, your gear has been washed away, so that's not a good deal. The wind. Uh, wind is, is a bad deal. It can make you really cold. Now, if you're in an environment where there's a lot of mosquitoes, you may want to use the wind. You may be up on a, a hilltop even, uh, so that the wind keeps the critters from bothering you. Uh, on the other hand, if it's really cold, you want to be careful and not be in a place where you're exposed to the wind. Wood, it's always a good idea to, to camp close to firewood. Uh, remember, you've got to carry this, you've got to process it. And uh, if you can get close to a large down tree where you can just break off branches, uh, obviously that's always better. Widow makers. You don't have a lot of them in this area, but back in the eastern woodlands where I teach, it's, it's a great big dead branch uh, that can fall on you and, and impale you to the ground in the middle of the night in a, in a high wind. Uh, I've camped out, as a matter of fact, last winter uh, we were down in the Red River Gorge down in Kentucky and uh, there was a huge wind came up and, and we could hear trees falling around us. 
and uh, we had selected a campsite, of course, it was safe. Make sure that you wear proper clothing for the first time you're out and for any environment that you're in. It's your first layer of shelter and your first line of defense and survival. Uh, make sure you dress to survive, don't just dress to arrive. Many people go out into the, you know, they drive from here to here to here, come from a warm house to a warm car to a, you know, a warm, you know, home with their neighbor or, the, you know, they go to church or they're going to a store or whatever and, and they're just, they don't really experience the cold, but you're driving 10, 15, 20 miles between spaces. If something would happen, you would find yourself needing to walk some distance and it's cold especially, uh, you could be in a really bad shape uh, and get severely frostbit before you get there. So make sure that you dress to survive, don't just dress to arrive. And make or build your own survival kit. It needs to be filled with items that you personally have used. Okay? <laughs> and that you are familiar with. So many people go out and buy commercial kits and they stick it in their trunk or put it in their, you know, in their bag and they're like, ah, oh, I've got a survival kit. They've never used any of it. They have no idea how it's, if it's durable or if it even functions right. So build your own survival kit. It needs to fit your needs and the needs of your family or your group. Most commercially made kits are full of low quality items that would perform poorly if you were in a real survival situation. Now, I will tell you that I would rather have it's a jet flying over there. <laughs> I'd rather have a $2 knife made in China than no knife at all. But if my life is going to depend on it, I want the best knife possible. The best knife that I can afford. Okay? Now I also make custom knives, so I have a little leg up on that. But the thing of it is, you've got to make sure that what you have will hold up because it may save your life and the life of your loved ones. So put the best you can afford into your survival kit and uh, just make sure that you're paying attention that you've actually used those gears. A good place to start for a survival kit is with the 10 C's of survival made popular by Dave Canterbury. And the 10 C's in order of importance from 1 through 10, uh, 1 being the hardest to reproduce in the wilderness with 10 being the easiest to reproduce in the wilderness. Number 1 is a cutting tool. Number two is a combustion device, something to start a fire. Number three is cover. You know, the Native Americans would have loved to have had a sheet of plastic. Okay, a garbage bag or a shower curtain or anything like that that you can actually make a waterproof shelter with. Uh, a container. There were entire uh, Native societies built up around making containers, baskets and, and uh, pottery and things like that. And then cordage. You know, you can, you can make it, but it's a whole lot easier just to have a hank of 50 or 100 feet of paracord or bank line or something with you. Uh, some kind of cotton material, cotton bandana for instance. Uh, you can use it for all sorts of things as a pre-filter for your water, bind up a wound, and uh, you can even make a sling out of it. There's a lot of things you can do with a cotton bandana or a piece of cotton. You can make charred cloth for instance for your next fire. Cargo tape. Uh, duct tape and uh, actually duct tape goes back to the, about 1898 when they put adhesive on duck cotton and that's where it gets its original name duct tape but cargo tape because it's trying to stick with the C's. Uh, number eight is a compass. A compass now I know that there's a lot of primitive ways to tell direction but a compass even if you don't have a map will keep you from wandering in circles and most people have a dominant side, either right or left, and they will actually travel in large circles. That's, that's not just a myth, that actually does happen. Number nine, a cloth sail needle. A heavy duty needle with a large eye that you can use to repair your gear. Uh, don't wait until something starts tearing and oh, I'll get by later and then it becomes, a small rip becomes, you know, a large hole. The old saying, a stitch in time saves nine, is, is, very durable, is a very good, a very durable saying because it, it holds up and you'll find out that if you repair things, they'll last you longer. Uh, number 10 is a candling device. And years ago before we talked about lumens, we talked about candle power. And so anything that will project light. So this could be your campfire. It could actually be a candle. If you're in the North Country and you make a snow cave, uh, a single candle can warm up a snow cave enough to, to get it above freezing and save your life. 
One of the things that, that we talk about and, and what I teach in my classes at all four phases is the seven survival priorities. And I have a video on this on my, on my YouTube channel. So the seven survival priorities plus one. First of all is fire. I'm going to try to go through these quickly. And uh, of course you can watch this video later on uh, as uh, it'll be on my YouTube channel. The ability to make fire and the knowledge of how to use it is of the utmost importance. Fire is a multi-tool in itself. It cooks your food, it purifies your water, hardens your wooden tools, gives warmth, provides light, signals rescuers, scares away predators, keeps the boogeyman away at night, and it's nature's TV. It's just fun to sit and stare into the fire at night. Fire is probably the most important first skill to learn and own. In my opinion, you should always have at least three means of starting a fire with you or on you. And you should always have some dry tinder with you in a Ziploc bag. I like to have the first three stages of fire with me whenever I go out. And these would be something like cotton balls. And to make sure they're cotton, make sure they're not the synthetic kind. They need to be 100% cotton. Soaked with Vaseline. You can use dryer lint, cedar bark, tulip poplar bark, dried grasses, etc. Anything you can process and make real finely shredded material out that will catch a spark or a flame. A few small sticks of fatwood. I love fatwood. This is pine pitch wood. And uh, you can buy a large box of it at Walmart for like $10. And it's just excellent fire starter. It's a natural product. It's waterproof. And uh, so it's, it's a great renewable resource. And you can make small curls and shavings with that for your fire starting. And then a small Ziploc bag of dried twigs. Just keep it with you. Just take a, you know, when it's not raining and everything's nice and dry, just go out and pick up a bunch of, of real small uh, twigs that'll fit, you know, I like a, a small bundle that'll fit inside of my hand like that and put it in a Ziploc bag. And that way you've always got the first three stages. So using the cotton balls, a couple of slivers of fat wood, and my little bundle of twigs, I now have enough heat that I can gather materials from the area even if it's been raining. And I've got enough heat to dry that out and build my fire. And I actually do have a video where I show you how to start a fire in the rain. It's actually raining and I go out and start a fire using this method. Water. A person can only live about three days without water, sometimes less in the desert if it's hot. Learn how to find and identify clean water sources. If no clean water is available, learn the steps how to make water safe to drink. Boiling is usually the best way to purify water, although there are some excellent water filters that work pretty well in most environments in the US as long as you aren't around heavy mining areas. Do remember that heavy metals, most of your water filters will not remove that. There are some, and, uh, and, but they're kind of expensive. So uh, just always keep that in mind. There are also water purification tablets, but some of them can take up to four hours to work. And if you're really thirsty and you really need some water, the last thing I want to do is wait four hours to get some to drink. So here's something for your notes. Water can be made safe to drink by holding it at 149 degrees Fahrenheit for six minutes. This will fully pasteurize the water, but I don't usually bring a way to determine the temperature. Do you bring a thermometer with you when you go out backpacking or in the wilderness? I don't. <laughs> However, just bringing it to a boil and letting it cool down enough to drink will accomplish this without using a thermometer or a watch. So you don't have to boil it for five minutes or 10 minutes, just bring it to a boil, and let it cool back down until you can drink it and you'll get your six minutes of pasteurization at 149 degrees. You should always therefore have a stainless steel bottle or titanium uh, with a removable cap for boiling in a fire. And uh, you can use a cotton cloth, as I said before, either a bandana or a t-shirt for filtering debris, known as turbidity, out of your water before boiling. Number three is shelter. It's easier to take shelter than it is to make shelter. A person can only generally survive for about three hours without shelter in certain environments. Again, always remember your first line of defense against the elements is the clothes you are wearing. Dress to survive, don't just dress to arrive. I want to stress that because that's very, very important. Make sure and use proper layering with an outer waterproof shell. Make sure and stay away from cotton, especially as a base layer in the winter as it holds moisture a long time. Uh, so unfortunately, a lot of the Fruit of the Loom and various other, uh, you know, your long johns are made out of cotton. Once cotton gets wet, it takes a long time to dry out, especially when it's cold. So polypropylene or any of your synthetics, uh, also wool, uh, get a merino wool base layer, fantastic stuff. And uh, so I would, I would highly recommend that instead of cotton. 
Actually, in the survival community, cotton is sometimes referred to as death cloth because once it gets against your skin and if it freezes, it'll freeze right next to your skin and, of course, then you're, you know, hypothermic. So, however, you do want to make sure and wear cotton in the summertime or in the desert as the evaporative cooling, because it does take a long time to dry out, the evaporative cooling will help keep you from overheating. So, pay attention to your clothing. And after that, having just a simple $10 6 by 8 tarp is better and easier to put up than the simplest of debris huts. Even if you decide to build a debris shelter, the tarp can be used to make the roof area 100% waterproof, which is the most difficult thing to achieve in natural shelters. Even one of the contractor garbage bags, 50, 42 to 55 gallon uh, garbage bag or drum liners, makes a pretty good shelter in a pinch. You can cut it open, slit the sides, and, and use that over the area where you're sleeping. And then if you have something like a wool blanket to roll up in, if you keep it in your car, uh, you're way ahead of most folks in a survival situation. The reason we like wool is wool will retain your body heat, 80% of your body heat, even when it's soaking wet. And wool has to be at least 50% wet before it feels wet. And so I know it's itchy, I know it's scratchy, uh, but the hollow fibers will help keep you warm. Food. We all need to eat food eventually. Even though the average person, believe it or not, can survive for 30 days without food, you're going to be pretty weak and miserable by the first week or so. You can mit mitigate that to some extent and practice by fasting now, which has many physiological and even some spiritual benefits. But you should always bring some food with you. Even some bullion cubes or hard candy will fit in all but the smallest of survival kits and will add flavor and calories to your situation. When it comes to foraging wild edibles, get to know at least 10 common and widespread, easily identifiable plants. I know there's going to be a foraging seminar here after a little bit, and, and I would highly recommend you going to that. It's better to know 10 plants well, however, than just sort of know 100. Uh, you need to know those that I said that are widespread and have a lot of uses. And so uh, there, there's different ones like that, in, depending on your area. Uh, you can build upon your knowledge in this area as you go more into the outdoors. Get a book with color pictures, not line drawings. All right? There are several good choices out there. Some suggested books are The Complete Guide to Edible Wild Plants, Department of the Army, 2009 edition, and The Forager's Harvest and Nature's Garden by Samuel Thayer. However, there is no substitute for going afield with an expert and learning from them. That is the best way. How about hunting? Well, hunting can be unproductive at times, even for experienced hunters. They often go out and return to camp empty-handed. So don't depend on hunting or trapping for your food. Game isn't always plentiful in every area. Now, if you're around water, catching fish is maybe the easiest way to get protein, if the fish are bi biting, or you can build a weir or a fish trap of some kind. It's also a familiar and recognizable taste for most people. Also, fish hooks are cheap and plentiful and very easy to pack, even in the smallest of kits, along with a few lards of at least 20-pound test fishing line. However, you're going to have to catch and clean a lot of fish to get very many calories. And uh, you can just do some quick, there's some, uh, some calorie calculators online in different areas. Uh, fish is good, it'll fill you, but it doesn't have a lot of calories for energy. I would also suggest learning about edible insects, worms and grubs. Oh yeah, you knew I was going to go there, didn't you? And uh, it may sound gross at first, but they are full of proteins and don't usually run away too fast. You don't have to chase them down. And so uh, many other countries, you know, relish them. And uh, I heard one person say it's unfortunate that Americans have such an aversion to insects and grubs and things like that because they really do hold a lot of, of calories and a lot of proteins. Uh, remember, laying down, you burn about 50 calories an hour. Standing about 100 calories an hour. If you're doing light work, maybe 150 calories an hour. And if you're doing very heavy work, you might be burning 450 calories an hour. So you're going to have to have a lot of food calories to sustain you. Just be careful that you don't burn so many calories obtaining food that you would have been better to just stay in camp. Okay? That's something to really think about. You've already got calories in you. Don't go out there and burn, you know, a thousand calories trying to track down a deer if you could have just stayed at camp. And in a survival situation, that's a very important consideration. You have to weigh that out. You want to make sure that you don't put yourself even deeper into a calorie deficit. So here's a little saying for you. If you don't have to be working, stand still. If you don't have to be standing, sit down. 
If you don't have to be sitting, lay down. If you don't have to be awake, sleep. Always burn the fewest calories possible. Hopefully you'll be rescued or you'll be able to self-rescue, get out of the situation. All right, number five, signaling. Three of anything is considered a distress signal. So this could be three shots, three blasts on a whistle, three flags fluttering in the air, uh, you know, three fires. Uh, any three is recognizable by search and rescue as being a, a survival signal for help. What catches search and rescue's attention as well as other searchers is color, contrast, and movement. Bright contrast and colors are best, such as a blue tarp. They've done research, and when you're looking from the air, a helicopter, airplane, a blue tarp is one of the easiest things to see. So just, just a cheap blue tarp. Because there's nothing, when you're looking earthward, that is in the natural environment that is that color. That's an artificial color. All right, you should have on you and with you a signal mirror, a bright light, a bright orange or red t-shirt, which can also double as an extra layer. And if it's cotton, you can use it to filter turbidity out of your water, as well as make charred cloth for your fire starting. So I would just say go to a Salvation Army, go to, go to you know, one of your other thrift stores, perhaps, Goodwill, and uh, find a, a nice shirt, uh, just a cheap t-shirt that's bright orange or bright red or bright yellow, and uh, make sure it's 100% cotton, and then it has multiple uses, as well as the fact that you can wear it uh, for an extra layer. And in a really bad situation, you can put that on and you, with the clothes you have and stuff in between the layers with dried leaves and grasses and things like that for uh, extra warmth. Stuff with new newspaper. Uh, a lot of folks have done that in the homeless community to stay warm. So you've got an extra shirt. It can actually help you quite a bit. You may even wish to carry flares or, or a flare gun. And uh, after you take care of your other survival priorities, begin to prepare to signal your rescuers. So the first thing you want to do is make sure and take care of, of any issues that you have right off. So let's talk about navigation. Knowing how to properly navigate could keep you out of a survival situation in the first place. Pay attention to your surroundings. Note any unusual tree, rock formation, hill, mountain, valley, creek, river, or any other terrain features as you walk. This is known as terrain association and it is a great skill to develop. Uh, be aware of your surroundings. And that way, when you, when you have to navigate, uh, you already recognize the shape of a mountain at a distance and where you were in location to it with your camp. So after you leave camp then, and you're going somewhere, uh, maybe to collect water or firewood, turn around every little while and do the same thing. Just identify your back trail. Because the thing of it is, if I'm going this direction, I see everything and it looks this way. But when I turn around, I've not seen anything that direction and it looks very unfamiliar to me. So make sure you turn around once in a while so that you know what your back trail looks like as well. That's how people get lost uh, just even a few hundred feet from camp because they don't know what camp looks like from that direction. And so they get lost pretty easy. All right, learn how to use a compass and a map and never forget that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and so does the moon. Okay. A lot of people know that, some don't, but it's a good thing to know. So you can, you can set, if, if, if the sun wasn't up during the daytime, but the moon is, take a stick, plant it in the ground. You know, this is east, and uh, when it goes the other direction, that's west, whichever one you can see. So that when you wake up in the morning, you know your basic cardinal directions, east to west, and then you can find north and south. Always plan your backcountry adventures and make sure and have a good map of the area with you, preferably a topographical map. When you're at camp and you have sufficient time and have some paper and a pen or pencil, it can be a good idea to draw a self-map of your location, your water source, wild edibles, and any other items of importance to you, along with how many steps or paces it takes to get to those areas. Also, if you do get lost and you are hoping for rescue, if you do have to leave camp for anything, make sure and leave a note for search and rescue, letting them know the approximate time you left your direction of travel and when you estimate you will return and if you have a little self map you've drawn of the area you can leave that as well and weight it down with the rock and that way they have a pretty good idea of where you are and they're not going to waste any more time getting to your location. First aid or self aid, this is number seven and depending on what happened to you to get you into a survival situation you might need to administer first aid or self aid to yourself or others. 
Could be a car, RV crash in a remote area, bush plane crash, a snowmobile failure, hiking accident, or fall off a small cliff. You fall off a big cliff, you're probably not going to need any help. But, you know, these, these small things that, that happen that cause us, you know, you, you've got a, a badly twisted ankle or, you know, hopefully it's not a, a terrible thing. But, but now you, you don't have the ability to just walk out and you're going to spend an, an emergency overnight. And it was just supposed to be a day hike and you've got minimal stuff. So make sure that you understand basic first aid. And whatever the cause, you will need to help either yourself or someone in that crisis. I would recommend taking a course or two in tactical life-saving or wilderness first aid as they both deal with extreme trauma and, and puncture wounds. Uh, you need to learn how to use a tourniquet, how to improvise a makeshift tourniquet, how to make basic splints for broken arms and improvise a sling for a broken arm. You should always have a first aid kit with you that contains more than just band-aids and aspirin. Again, build your own kit and make sure you know how to use everything that's in it. And because uh, when the time comes, you're not going to want to have to like search and I wonder what's in this kit. You know, you want to you just pull things out and go right to what you need. Get a copy of the Wilderness Survival Medicine Handbook. Read it and pack it with you in your kit. It could save a life, maybe even yours. So there's, there's one more area and this is self-protection. So it's seven survival priorities plus, plus one. And we might call this the eighth priority. But this is a specialized field, and I would recommend that you get training in the specific area in which you wish to be able to defend yourself and your loved ones. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be Rambo, but the, the point of it is you often will be in cities or areas or counties where certain forms of self-protection are not allowed. And so in that, in that case, you want to make sure that you have alternatives. Uh, however, in the wild country, you may not be just concerned about two-legged predators, but also, and especially the four-legged kind. Talked about bears, mountain lions, wolves, etc. You definitely have to be careful. Watch behind you, and I'll remind you again, secure your food away from camp. Two to three hundred yards if possible, either in a bear bag, uh, and it doesn't have to be a bear-proof bag, just something that you can hang up uh, from a tree ten feet up and ten feet out in black bear country, even farther out and up in grizzly territory. Or you might wish to carry your food in a bear-proof container. They do make those, and uh, you can pack all your stuff in it. But again, don't leave it right close to camp. And, and believe me, just because it's in a tin can, uh, bears can just rip them open with their, with their claws and teeth. And uh, I've seen pictures and photos of, of tin cans that were just shredded where a bear got a hold of it. So make sure you keep your stuff away from camp and in some kind of a bear-proof container. You might also wish, if you're in a survival situation, to use thorn bushes. Uh, to build a wall around your shelter and you can also put a point on a stick uh, to protect yourself. Now please don't attach your knife to a stick and throw it like a spear because if you do happen to stick it in the animal and it runs off with your spear knife combination now you don't have your knife anymore and you or you could miss and hit a rock you could chip the blade or or break the point off there's there's all kinds of things now if you're going to use it as a spear and just hold it and jab with it you might want to do that but uh, again sometimes it just use a pointy stick uh, if you sharpen it enough and put it in a fire and fire harden it shrink down the molecular structure so that uh, it, it gets hard enough uh, it'll you can actually do that to make your own arrows as well uh, but that's a that's a whole other territory if you have the time, abilities, and resources, you can make a self bow and arrows, but you need, to be, you need to be familiar with hunting like that. You don't have peep sights. You don't have all the nice let offs and everything that come with compound bows. Uh, you know, if you're making a self bow, it's going to be very primitive, and so you need to make one in practice if you're going to intend to do that. Now, if you tend to be frightened at night, remember that all wild animals are scared of fire. So keep yours burning brightly. And the rule of thumb for firewood, especially in cold climates, is first of all, gather as much wood as you think you need. Look at the pile and then go get five times that much. <laughs> yes, you will be surprised at how much wood you can go through on a long, cold winter's night. Because remember, winter's nights are long. And oh, it's, there's, it's miserable to wake up 3 or 4 a.m. and realize you've got hours until daylight and you've got almost no firewood. So don't do that. All right, backcountry adventuring. I want to talk to you about the four adventure states. Uh, the first adventure state is play. So in, in this, you're, you're just going out into the back country. You're well within your comfort zone. Uh, you're just messing around enjoying yourself, right? So this, you're just having a great time. The next level uh, is adventure. And you begin to take yourself seriously and you start applying your skills. But you're still quite comfortably within your skill level. 
The third level is Frontier Adventure. And you're right on the boundaries of your skill set and experience. And if you get things wrong, it could go badly for you. And, and honestly, that's a fun place to be. Uh, it really is. So where you're, you're right at the edge of your skill set, your, your endurance, your understanding and knowledge, and you're challenging yourself. You're kind of pushing the boundaries. Uh, but you do need to have some skill before you do that or you can get in trouble. Then the fourth level is misadventure. This is where things truly go wrong. Your resources and skills are out of balance with the factors that are affecting you. The red lights are flashing and the danger is real. So you got to be careful about that. You need to be sure then before you embark on an adventure that you are ready for what you might face and that you weigh the risk as well as the confidence level of your own skills. If you want to read more about this, this is from a book called The Adventure Alternative by Colin Mortlock. Let me talk to you for a little bit here uh, about core temperature control and managing exposure. Survival really is about 98.6 degrees. Did you know that? So if you think about this, your body temperature can go up to 106 before you start to experience brain damage from too much heat. And then on the other side, uh, about 92 degrees is your core temperature is where if you're not careful, uh, you can go into a state of shock and lose consciousness. So it's about a 14, 14 and a half degree temperature range. That's all you have. And so from starting a fire to getting adequate food and water to sleeping well at night, all of those factors can start to affect you. As a matter of fact, after about nine days without sleep, you start to die. They've done studies on sleep deprivation. And nine days without sleep, you'll, you'll start to die. Now, your body can't handle it. So getting a good night's sleep, getting food, getting water, all of the skills that we teach go to keeping that core temperature at 98.6 degrees on average. So that's your core temperature. You want to maintain that. According to Morris Kohansky, who just passed away this last December, uh, who was considered the, uh, the godfather of bushcraft, wonderful Canadian, uh, you can see some of his videos online, but exposure is about 20 things. We talk about people, they, they died from exposure. You know, what a world is that? Well, there's, there's different definitions, but there's about 20 things that each one reinforces the other, and the body cannot cope with the stresses and begins to shut down. Statistically, the average time in which many people perish from exposure when they don't know how to cope with the stresses of the wilderness is somewhere around 36 to 38 hours. Of course, this is Morse Krahansky, a very wonderful guy who did many, many years of, of study in this and, and training as well. So how do I identify the onset of exposure? Well, exposure assessment is the process of estimating or measuring the magnitude, frequency, and duration of exposure to an agent or to the elements in our case. So you're trying to figure out how this happens. So slurred speech, trouble concentrating, uncontrolled shivering, high or low body temperature, poor mental state, and the list goes on and on. But the person ceases to function normally and you can tell there's something wrong either with yourself or someone else. Uh, one of the ways you know if you're getting too hypothermic, for instance, is you can't touch your pinky to your thumb. Okay, when you can't do that, you are too hypothermic. You can't flick a bick at that point. You don't have the motor skills. Your, your hands won't function right. So it's a good thing to know. It literally is a rule of thumb uh, to be able to do that. All right, so how do we mitigate the factors that lead to exposure? By training, experience, and understanding. So what are the 20 factors or so that lead to exposure? I would divide them into two categories. First of all, there's physical factors, and then there's emotional and physiological factors, or psychological factors. All right, first of all, uh, let's talk about the physical factors. They are heat, cold, wet, hunger, thirst, exhaustion, health, injury, age, resources, weather, season, location and clothing. So these are 14 things that physically can affect you. And then there are the emotional or psychological aspects. Fear, panic, depression, ignorance, skills and knowledge. These are the things that we can carry in our head or that in our heart burden us. Uh, some people just give up. They lose the will to live. Having a, a, a picture of your family with you or your loved one or someone you care deeply about. Uh, just looking at that can be immensely uh, important. Uh, get a picture of, of, of that loved one, of those families, whatever, and, and you know, put it in a waterproof bag, just a Ziploc or something, and keep it with you. 
uh, because if you get in a survival situation, it can be very important. In conclusion, survival in a phrase is to survive all. It's a conjunction of two words, survival, survive all, right? And it all starts with a will to live and a desire to plan and prepare for living for a time, if need be, on your own, using only the resources that are provided in nature. You know, we're all living on a planet with wonderful opportunities all around us. If we are careful and plan well, we may never be in a survival situation in the first place. However, if you do find yourself in that place someday, I hope that what you've heard uh, will give you some of the information that you need to endure and be reunited with your loved ones. And I also want to add that for many of you, you're, you're persons of faith, as I am. And having some faith and having somebody to talk to when you're, when you're really down and out keeps you from feeling lonely. And they've done studies with people that in concentration camps and various emergency and survival situations. And being able to pray, being able to have that sense of, of communion, communication, uh, like I said, I'm, maybe not all of you have that, but I am a person of faith. And that's very important to me uh, because I might be lonely, but I'm not alone. And so I just would encourage all of you, uh, you know, when you're in that situation and as you're thinking those positive thoughts and trying to keep from falling into despair, uh, remember that you are loved and you are an important person. And you keep all that stuff in mind, keep that in balance. So get out there. Have a great time. Stay safe. Get ready. And then when you go out, you will enjoy the wilderness. Thank you so much.